believe that leadership isn't a position or a role, it's an action and a choice. I believe that leadership can be learned. I believe that great leaders emerge from adversity. I believe that Happy Valley is full of great leaders. These are their stories. So welcome to the show. Today I have with me Laura Weiss, the Senior Vice President for Research at Penn State. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. It's an honor. Um, so Laura, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got to Penn State? So first off, I have the best job at Penn State. I'm the Senior Vice President for Research here, where I oversee nearly a billion dollars of really cool research and discoveries. Not only do we have a top research and talent, but we are, our portfolio is really extensive and broad. We have 12 academic colleges, 22 campuses, seven institutes, a Department of Defense Research Unit, two law schools, a medical school, and an agricultural extension. So it's all very, very exciting. But you wanted to know how I got here. Well, I started here. I started my career here at Penn State, um, and I was here for 16 years. I then left and went to Georgia Tech for 13 years. And then two years ago, I came back in this role as our leader of our entire research enterprise. Um, but since this is a podcast on leaders, you probably want to know how I got into the leadership position as opposed to just a career change. So, so for starters, let me just comment, and, and you'll hear some common themes here. But leadership skills, as you know, are not developed overnight. They really are acquired. They're learned, sometimes the hard way. They result from good mentors and bad mentors, and they constantly need to be refined based on experiences and the times. Times change. And I think we're seeing that a lot, you know, during COVID and this pandemic. But there's a balance of the adrenaline rush of wanting to charge forward, you know, with great ideas, wholeheartedly go make some change and do fun things. And also the, um, the incredible discipline need for patients in critical situations. And I'll talk a little bit about that, too. Um, my personal pathway was through my technical expertise in artificial intelligence, robotics, and unmanned systems. Shortly after I got my PhD, I ran a fairly large multi-year research project with an extensive field component. Um, so we were designing, developing, launching underwater robots off the coast near Seattle. It's involved leading um, a lot of people with many different skills from hardware to software to field tests and experimentation. And there were a lot of moving parts, hardware fails, software fails, the weather doesn't cooperate, and a lot of decisions need to be made in, in real time on the spot. And, and that's where the, the disciplined um, structures and leadership skills really come into play because when you're doing things with incomplete information just on the spot, you, you have to have some, um, some, some training basically behind it, some understanding of, of how do you make the right, how do you make a decision? It's not always the right decision, but how do you make a, a sound decision in a very transparent way? Um, so I became, then after that, I became head of a group of about 100 people, again, leading individuals with different skills and in areas that were broader than robotics and artificial intelligence. It expanded to modeling and simulation, signal processing, data analysis, again, broadening my leadership responsibilities in size and breadth. So that was the first 16 years of my career. <laughs> I then went to Georgia Tech for 13 years, and there I started out as a lab chief scientist, and then I moved into the, the role of being their chief technology officer and of a major defense research unit that they have on campus. That has more than 2,000 people doing about $600 million of research. So we're getting close to Penn State's $1 billion number there. Um, but so this is where my leadership perspective is really broadened beyond, even farther beyond AI and robotics, but into radar and cyber and 5G and developing a lot of um, applied research advances for the Department of Defense and National Security. And um, I culminate, my last position there was as their interim director of that enormous unit um, before I came to Penn State to run something even bigger. So at every step, I, I, I not only brought in the research portfolio that I was responsible for, but I also had a lot of oversight, larger dollar amounts, larger numbers of people, larger operations, which meant dealing with more challenges, more issues, and more complexities at every stage. So this is where, you know, the, the lessons of leadership come in. You know, you can't be an, ex an expert in everything it takes to run such a large operation. You really need to know your strengths, and then you need to surround yourself with top talent. And then you need to trust and empower those individuals. 
So, so this leads, you know, I'll kind of wrap up this question with a few common leadership themes that you'll hear from me. You know, so as a leader, when you're tackling these, these large complex issues, you need to surround yourself with experts and hear multiple perspectives. You need to realize there's multiple ways to achieve objectives. And so think through them. You need to listen, 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 listen to what people are saying and what people are not saying because there's messages behind both of those. You really need to empower and support your team. And then you need to be willing to make hard decisions and you need to be transparent about it. So people will recognize that they may not agree with all of your decisions, but if you explain to them how you came to your decision and why, they'll at least understand it. And again, that goes back to um, tr trusting your team and, and having confidence in them. So those are kind of the five you know, highlights of, of what, what you'll hear from me when I talk about some of the, the leadership experiences that I've been through, you know, during my 30 plus career. Wow. Well, it's, it's an impressive uh, resume of, of leadership activities. And, and as you said, really growing in size and scope um, and complexity leading to your current role. And fun. <laughs> and fun. Um, as you think back in your leadership development, you know, what person or people influenced you to be the leader that you've become today? Yeah, yeah, there's there's always good leaders and bad leaders, and they both um, impart influences on, on, on your style. I, th I think the biggest influence was very early in my career. That was a real confidence booster when I was pregnant with my first child, who is now 25 years old, by the way. But my boss asked what it would take to keep me working. And part of my job was to travel back and forth to DC. We did it all the time. Um, and there was a flight from State College from Happy Valley down to Dulles, but it was very expensive. But you could fly down and back in a day. And I really wanted to be, you know, at home in the morning, you know, when my child woke up and I wanted to be home with my family for, for dinner or even if it's a late dinner or put them to bed. And so I asked my boss, you know, when he asked, you know, what, what will it take? I told him, let me take that flight whenever I wanted to. And um, his, his response was an exuberant, take it anytime you want. Um, th this sent a very strong message though. First, he was smart enough to ask me instead of assuming he knew best. And, and again, that goes back to listening and asking your team. And second, he embraced the approach wholeheartedly. I'm sure it was not the answer he was expecting, but again, this comes back to getting multiple, multiple perspectives, listening, realizing there's more than one way to, to do things and, and empowering others. You know, when he said, you know, take it whenever you want, it was not a come ask me before you every trip and get my approval. It was just go. So, so he really listened to something he asked um, and he empowered, that was just very empowering. So, and, and that really helps um, anyone boost their career. Cause if you know, you have the liberty and confidence to do what you need to do and what you know is best. Um, and again, as long as you do things appropriately and thoughtfully and professionally, empowering others is, is just a critical motivator. And that was one individual who, who really did put a lot of confidence in me. That's a great story. And his loyalty to you as an employee, I can only imagine the loyalty that, that you mm -hmm. then had to, to him and the organization willing to, to say, yeah, we like that plan. We're willing to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, the other part about that is now it's your plan, right? So he asked you and, and you said, yes, I'll do this you're now you're fully committed, right? right. At, to, okay, well now I'm going to do a great job. I've been given this, this kind of extra bonus of, um, of this flexibility. I'm going to do great things with it. So it had to be tremendously motivating. Absolutely. I, I owned it. I was empowered and I owned yes. it. So, but yes. that, that's the right motivation that, that if, you know, we want to impart in all our leaders. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Mm -hmm. As you think back in your career, um, you know, one of the things I talk about is adversity really forming leaders. Can you think of some times of adversity in your career that helped shape the leader that you've become? Yeah, well, um, when you get to the leadership role, it's always the hard problems that bubble up, right? <laughs> the easier problems you should be delegating to others to deal with, so those you empower. Um, but, but really, part of leading is trying to get to the bottom of things before a situation becomes adverse. And it, it's hard because you can't anticipate everything. 
So, so this is where patience and a meter discipline approach is needed to thinking through things. Um, it's really important to get facts, to get inputs from the experts around you. Um, it's, it's where you really need the rational objective thought. It's, it's really crucial at that point. Um, it's kind of where you need to think before you act. You need to think not only, so this is another one of my philosophies, not only about the step that you're gonna take, but if you take that step, what will the reaction be? And then, what will be your response to that reaction? So it's, what are you gonna do? What will the response be to what you do? And then what is your response gonna to be to that response? That really is thinking three steps ahead, but, but you have to get into the habit of thinking of that like that. Because if you don't have a plan for after that second step, um, th things can, can go downhill very quickly. Um, so, so it really is important to have the, the patience to think through that. Um, I, I also try to put a very positive perspective on situations. You know, we all have bad days and we always will, and not everything's going to always go right. But, but a colleague of mine put it in perspective. He was in Vietnam when the Viet Cong entered one of his buildings and killed many of his, his comrades, and he survived. And, and, and I just never forget this. He comes up and he says, that was a bad day. Anything compared to that is not so bad, and we can get through it. So when things get bad, it's really important to work through it, to talk through it, um, but you just hope you never have a bad day as bad as that one. So, so the, the pandemic was another example. You know, responses and decisions had to be and continue to be made in real time with incomplete information and with limited resources. So, you know, early on, it was clear that the underlying principles was to make sure we protect the health and safety of individuals and our healthcare workers and our, our community and make sure our hospitals don't get overwhelmed. Um, the amount of behind the scenes thought that had to go into that was was really um, was was really crucial to make making sure our communities and our university, um, you know, just was able to keep a balanced course. That was really hard. Um, and while all of this was underway, you know, here we are focusing on making sure we our community and, and our university and, and all our individuals are safe from a, a health perspective. We want to make sure the research enterprise was moving forward as best possible. So as a leader in any business during a crisis, if you put 100% of your team's effort into the crisis, in this case, in the pandemic, the other parts of your business could collapse. So it's really important that you do have people who focus on the crisis, but you also have individuals who could focus on maintaining the mission. And, and that's imperative to, for making it through the crisis because once the crisis settles down, you have to be you have to have something to bounce back on. And, um, and, and even while it's going, you have to have those who, who don't necessarily need to be focused on that crisis, have them working on, um, on the stability of the operation or the enterprise. And, and we did that. The, the, you know, the university created a coronavirus management team, um, but in, in parallel, we focused on research where we instrumented some labs for remote operations. We created schedules for what, when people could access certain spaces, but in a way that kept the density very low. We allowed people to take home equipment that was safe to take home as safely as possible. Um, but it's back to the core tenants. It's listening from those who were knowledgeable on the different options that were out there and on how to do this, providing flexibility and empowering them to move forward. We allowed every college on campus and, and, at, the, and at the campuses to decide how best to make what their standard operating procedures for research in a de-densified pandemic environment should be. And, and we empowered them to do that because every college is different. Every campus is different. They have different needs. Your, your needs for um, in, in the arts and architecture, you know, in theater are very different than a lab in biology. And so well that so far that seems to have worked pretty well. Um, and, and in all of this, I must emphasize that you can't forget the human dimension. A colleague once told me, may all your problems be technical. It's really important to recognize that human nature is not a one size fits all. You know, people are, are our brain trust and they have a lot of good ideas. They also have unique personal home lives and situations and, and you really have to bring the, the, um, the human dimension into that. Their hearts and minds are all in the right place if you empower them, um, listen to them and, and not be super rigid on, on certain directions and dimensions. It's tricky, but it's exciting and rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that is something that's really unique about leadership in a, a very technical domain is understanding that it's, it's absolutely that mix. And so you need to have the technical understanding, but these are human beings that are executing all this. 
something that I heard in, in a couple of your answers, and I'd, I'd like to drill into just a little bit, is this idea of making decisions with incomplete information. And it's absolutely right. And it's something I don't think I've talked about yet on this podcast about how do you do that? I mean, I've heard quotes from, I think Colin Powell says, you know, as a leader, if you have 30% of the information that that's good enough, you know, use your gut and, and go with it. And you hear people talking about the, the 80% rule. You know, how do you think through situations with, with incomplete information and make decisions? Yeah. So, so, so first off, you have to remember there's two, two sides to every story and it's more than two sides usually. So, so the first thing you have to do is try to gather as many facts as you can. If you spend all your time trying to get all of the facts 100% complete, well, first off, they may not exist, um, but you could also slow down your decision-making. And if you, if you need to make a decision quickly or timely, maybe quick, you know, you have to make a timely decision, you may not have time to get all of the information. So again, you, you know, I mentioned you surround yourself with experts. You, you, you ask them, you say, go out, let's start gathering as much of the information as we can. Let's get a, as close to a factual represent, representation of, of what the situation is. And then you, you have to sit there and weigh the pros and cons of, of, of what you're seeing, have conversations, a lot of conversations back to that, getting a lot of people's perspectives, what you may think are the pros and cons, somebody else might disagree. They may say there's other pros, other cons. Uh, and, and we're seeing that right with the, with the pandemic. Um, everything with, that has to surrounding vaccination. You, you, you think you have facts, but there's so many different perspectives out there of, of, of what people are thinking. So, so now you have to make a decision um, on, on how to move forward. And you wanna get as many inputs as you can. You wanna think it through. You wanna think through the three steps. If you do something, what will the response be? And then what will your response to that response be? And then if, if you can get yourself into a good place on you think that you have that third step um, sufficiently well thought out or partially thought out at least um, so that you're prepared for what may come, then you communicate to everybody, this is how we're going to move forward. Um, and the communication on that decision, sometimes people want you to move faster, but sometimes for the really hard problems, you want to slow down the thought and say, you know, okay, are we good with this? And then when everyone's on board, you know, you say, now let's go. Transparency is important. Um, sometimes decisions have to be made faster. Sometimes you can't wait for all those steps, but you, you try to get as close to that thought process as possible. It's never perfect. Nothing's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And that's helpful. I think um, how you demonstrated that the process that you use, that you've, you've described, it, it works in different situations and it helps you get to the best answer that you have in the time available, right? So. It usually works and you get to a pretty good answer, but, but you'd really, you, you try for the ideal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm curious about leadership in the, in the technical realm. You've, you've been a leader in the technical world. You've, you've worked with researchers, you've worked with um, you know, PhDs, faculty members, and you've worked obviously in administrative roles um, can, is there, what's unique about leading in the technical domain and, and leading um, researchers and faculty that's maybe different from other areas that you exercise your leadership? Yeah, so, so leading at a university, first off, you have a lot of faculty um, who, are, who are really smart, right? So, you, so you're trying to lead um, a, a lot of really bright people who have um, who can be quite intense at times, right? But their heart's in the right place. They, you know, as, as with most people, they, they genuinely want to do the right thing. Um, and you really have to risk, and sometimes the way they come at things can be a little strong, um, or a little forward, but you have to really respect it that they're, they, they are where they are because they're experts in their field. And you really have to listen to, to what they're saying. Um, whatever the situation is. So, so it's a little bit, a, a, a bit of a different dynamic maybe than, than in other places or with different types of expertise, but, but, but leading real, really smart people um, is it, not trivial, but, but, but again, it, it, it's, a, it's a communication, communication is critical um, and, and getting to a common understanding and, and getting a shared vision and being able to discuss decisions in a transparent way um, is, is where the patience comes in. Yeah, 
That makes yeah. sense. But, but it's also where you get to hear really cool ideas and, and new thoughts and new approaches. And you say, wow, I never would have thought of that. But, you know, that's a good idea. How, now, how can we do that? So, so you have to really be open to doing things differently as well. And do you find that challenging? You know, in research, I think it lends itself towards innovation, right? That, that seems critical. But in your administrative role, it, it, it's often viewed as a threat, the innovation and change. Do you, do you find any dichotomy there or does that, that no, work in both no, places? I, I, I think instead of, instead of calling it a, a threat, I, I think we all need to constantly be innovating and reevaluating where we are. We, we have to be mindful of consistency, certain amounts of consistency. Um, if, you're, if you're constantly changing, you're flipping from you know, one approach to the next, then there's no stability. Um, that's disruptive in a, in a negative kind of way. So, so you really have to balance, um, you don't wanna chase every shiny object or every, you know, everything that comes in front of you. That's where the, the balance and the conversation, the discussion has to happen. It's if we do this, um, what will the response be? And then how are we gonna to respond to that? And if the answer is we're constantly changing policies or we're constantly changing you know, computer systems or we're constantly, if it's, if it's so much change that it, it's more disruptive than innovative, then that's a problem. But how do you um, make sure you open up the opportunities for, we're in a university environment where, where we should embrace and we can embrace new ideas and new approaches. And we should always be, we shouldn't hold ourselves back. We shouldn't tie our own hands behind our back. There's, there's plenty of other federal and state and local regulations and policies that, that will do that for us. So, so we have to just navigate this in, in a, in as rational approach as we can, um, always, every day. We're having these conversations every day. Yeah, I think that's yeah. absolutely right. I think we do yeah. spend a lot of time limiting it ourselves in our own minds, and uh, and we don't take advantage of the opportunities to even try things, right? Even if it doesn't work, let's at right. least try it and let's try some innovation um, rather than just being stuck with where we are today. Yeah, here, here when I came to Penn State, you know, two years ago, it was everything became a pilot, which was great. You know, let's let's pilot this, let's pilot that. So that was our way to try things out. And it was funny because there were so many pilot programs, which was awesome, right? So let, let's try it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we tried. And if it works, let's adopt it. Yeah. And so, yeah. So Laurie, as you think about your leadership development over the years, um, are there things that you would recommend for people who are younger leaders or still evolving in, you know, obviously leadership never, development never really ends, but what would you recommend to people who want to build their leadership skills? Are there books or podcasts or training or authors that you would recommend? Yeah. So, so, so first and foremost is surround yourself with good people and find a, you know, a good leader to be your mentor, even if it's unofficial, you know, just someone you can just watch from afar. The, the real thing is to, um, and, and don't think you can go from, you know, just, being an assistant professor to being the senior vice president for research managing a billion dollars, you know, on day one, right? So, so it, it, there are certain skills and disciplines that, that you learn along the way. And I said, some in a good way, sometimes you learn the hard way. Um, but, but the point is to start, if, if you want to get to um, managing a billion dollar portfolio, you want to start managing smaller portfolios first, building up small groups, you know, manage a center, manage a lab, manage a, uh, you know, just a group. Um, so you understand the nuances, what it takes to lead. And, and there's a difference, by the way, between leadership and management. Um, and, and then you want to start growing the group that you're leading. And then, and then maybe, then you take your next step um, and, and go to something bigger. And then you take your next step and go to something bigger. Because every step of the way, there's, there's a nuance, there's a complexity, there's a, wow, I've never experienced that before. So that by the time you're running a, a, a major research enterprise, um, you've, you've, you've developed certain skills, certain um, techniques that will help you, that'll help make things smoother. A lot of patience, you develop a lot of patience too. Yeah. But books, okay, so you wanna talk about books. I, you know, I, I know you, you threw that um, early on and, and, and I'm gonna, I am gonna talk to you about a couple of books that I think Kind of show this these same traits and they're not your traditional business school books and and these are books that um i've read over this past year and, and I'm, I'm going to 
talk to you about them, a few of them in, in the order of I read, that I read them, not in any kind of order of priority. And so the first book is called The Perfect Predator by Stephanie Strathy. So this is a story of an epidemiologist at the University of California, San Diego, and she and her husband went on a trip to Egypt. He got an incredibly nasty bacterial infection um, that was not responsive to any antibiotics. So, and he was in pretty rough shape back in Egypt. So then they had to figure out how to medevac him from Egypt to Germany to the US. And then they figured, had to figure out how to treat him and nothing was working. He was not responsive. It was really, really rough. And so she had to navigate how, how do you, what do you do? And there was a, being an epidemiologist, she knew a little bit about public health, a lot of bit about public health. Um, and she was able to um, do lots of reading and learning from other experts around her um, on something called phage therapy. You know, these are um, viruses that, that attack bacteria. And so, um, so she was looking at these phage therapies and, and they were kind of put on the back burner for many, many years, but the Navy had a whole um, stockpile uh, of, um, of, of phage. You know, they just had a whole library of, of phage banks, basically. And so she worked with experts there and at other universities. Again, she had to reach out to experts, listen to people, hear what they were saying. Then she worked with the FDA. How do you get approval to use this treatment? I mean, at every step, again, she, did, she didn't take no for an answer, but she had to coordinate in a very calm, professional way of interacting with people. She orchestrated the whole thing. So listening to all the different perspectives. And then once she figured things out, she empowered people to go forward and, and she was able to make bold decisions. Um, and in the end, um, her husband survived, which was pretty incredible being how, what he had was really, I mean, he, he, was, he was not in good shape for a while. Um, but, but again, it was just, she just took the leadership role to orchestrate everything. Um, and so that same kind of thing that we've been talking about. And another book I really like is called The Code Breaker. This one's by Walter Isaacson. And this is the book um, that focuses on the 2020 Nobel Prize winner, winner um, Jennifer Doudna, where she and her colleagues discovered um, the DNA editing tool called CRISPR. So again, awesome, awesome science on the gene editing, but it really also describes how um, Dr. Doudna led the field while collaborating, competing, persevering through patent challenges and professional challenges. Again, the leadership skills that she demonstrated again and again is the common theme of tackling complex issues, recognizing you don't have all the answers, seeking experts, realizing there's multiple ways to achieve your objectives, empowering your team and making decisions. And then the final book I wanted to tell, talk to you about is um, a book called This is How They Tell Me the World Ends by Nicole Perlroth. And, and this book focuses on global cyber the global cyber weapons arms race. And that's the market for zero day exploits and the overt and covert actions that everyone involved in the global scene, everyone from individuals who are buying, selling, creating the exploits and, and finding the exploits to the federal governments, the national leaders of, around the world who are figuring out what do you do when you learn about these exploits? What would you do when you find them? What if you have one? What if you need one? How all the nuances and complexities um, at the international level, uh, again, um, being aware of the magnitude of the situation of, of what these exploits could do um, and the potential consequences. And it, again, fascinating, fascinating read on, on how people think through the decisions and the actions and the steps they'll take. So, so all of these books just show that leadership requires that constant disciplined approach. Um, but while you're making some assertive decisions and taking bold steps, but I do wanna say it's not the wild west. You really have to think through things. And that said, I did recently read a Western called The Siege at Riker Station. And that one's by Lee Martin. But so it's always great to get a break and enjoy an action filled novel. So, yeah. Well, those are great. And they sound, all of those sound super interesting awesome. and so relevant to everything we've talked about today. I'll put links to those in the, the show notes. Oh, great. So just to wrap up, any do you have any web or social media presence or if someone wants to get to know more about mm -hmm. you that they could uh, do that? Yeah, the best media presence is less about me and more about the research at Penn State. So if you could please just visit www.psu.edu slash research. There you'll find some incredible accomplishments by our researchers. Um, there'll be a blog there that I had written for diggingdeeper.psu.edu. It, it talks about what it takes to build the top research enterprise and rising to the challenge. So but like I said, I have the best job here. Lots <laughs> of fun. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your service and leadership to Penn State. Thank you. And thank you for, um, for organizing this podcast. I appreciate it. You're Have welcome. a great day. You too. 
Thank you for listening to the Happy Valley Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Give us a review and share us with others. You can follow us on Twitter at HV Leader Podcast and on YouTube at Happy Valley Leaders Podcast. Remember, leadership is an action and a choice. So go be a leader.